Let me read to you a passage from the 18th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 1 to chapter 19, verse 42. That very long passage is the account of the Passion of our Lord according to the Gospel of St. John, which is read on Good Friday afternoon at the ceremony of the Passion of the Lord. I will only read part of it because of its length. So St. John writes, Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Then he, when he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you as the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. That is part of the gospel for Good Friday afternoon, the commemoration of the Passion. The gospel itself goes from John chapter 18, verse 1 to chapter 19, verse 42. I have just read only part of it. You know, I once attended a public forum involving a coming together of Catholics and Muslims to share what Christ and Muhammad each stood for in respect to faithfulness and compassion. The forum mainly consisted of a presentation from a Catholic representative and a Muslim representative, and the one spoke of Jesus, the other of Muhammad. 
I was most disappointed in the presentation by the Catholic representative. There was no mention by him of Christ's faithfulness to his mission of bearing witness to the truth of his own person, which was that he was divine, the Son of God made man. The central point which was Christ's divinity remained unsaid. It would have been a hard saying for the many Muslims there, but as an opportunity to speak of Christ, it was a chance sadly missed. Jesus claimed to be divine and was understood by his friends and his enemies as claiming this, and his faithfulness was demonstrated by his acceptance and embrace of death in witness to this truth. Christ's compassion was above all at work in his bearing the sins of the entire world, expiating for them by his death. Every man and woman in history can say with St. Paul, Christ loved me and gave himself for me. His compassion led him to die for the redemption of mankind. At that forum, this point too was missed by the Catholic representative and I wondered whether he failed to mention these critical points about Christ for fear of arousing hidden hostility in the minds of the Muslims. Perhaps not. Perhaps he felt it was not appropriate to bring forward Christian dogma about Christ and the Atonement so explicitly. The effect of his presentation, though, was that Christ was portrayed as a good and holy preacher who went to his death bearing witness to the kingdom of God and that was the long and the short of it. I had the feeling that for the Muslims, Christ may have appeared as simply a good but failed preacher with a great message who haplessly lost his life in the process. Many Muslims in that hall would have thought that Christ could not be compared with the successful Muhammad. But Christ's success was intimately bound up precisely with his acceptance and carrying of the cross. Humanly speaking, all went wrong, and the means he chose to succeed were diametrically opposed to the means of the world, including the means chosen by Muhammad. Christ redeemed the world from sin not by winning the allegiance of Jerusalem, the capital, or the majority of the people, which is what Muhammad could claim to have achieved in his geographical setting, but precisely by bearing witness to the truth of his person and mission. This he did by accepting obediently his passion and death, which was the consequence of this witness. Obedience to the Father in the midst of suffering and death was the way the Son of God made man achieved perfect success. For this reason he was able to cry out at the point of death, It is accomplished. Christ died for our sins, and by dying he destroyed our death. By his death he and he alone opened the gates of heaven to mankind. This is what the Christian world celebrates in commemorating the passion and death of Jesus Christ. For this reason, Christ cannot be compared with nor put on the level of any other founder of a religion. His mission was unique and unheard of. His person too was and is unique. Above all, the climax of his life and its crowning moment is beyond compare. This moment was his death on the cross. Its effect pervades the whole of mankind and the entire universe because it attacked and broke the power of sin, which is nothing other than disobedience to God. Christ's obedience on our behalf snapped the deadly grip of our disobedience. If we but unite ourselves to him, his obedience will save us from our own disobedience. A fundamental dogma of the Christian faith is that of the atonement, Christ atoning by his death for the sins of the world. And that is above all what we commemorate and celebrate on Good Friday. The Christian is called to believe this with all his heart, to bear witness to the truth of it by his words and his life. He bears witness to it in his life by accepting with the mind of Christ the sufferings that come his way and which God permits. Let us gain the strength to do this by a fervent life of prayer and participating in the sacraments, especially the sacrament of penance and the Eucharist.